Hello, this video is for you if you are looking to work with a therapist or a coach or a healer of some kind to help you with scapegoat child recovery. So because it's such a niche area, um, there are some pitfalls that we need to avoid and I'd love to share some tips and recommendations for you so you can find the very best person out there to help you heal and recover um, with ease and with speed. One of the challenges that we have um, when we have experienced the role of the family scapegoat is that it's a particular area of abuse that a lot of professionals are not trained in, don't have any knowledge of, and therefore don't have any tools to help us heal from the complex childhood trauma. And as the title of my video alludes to, the mistake I'm referring to is to get in contact with a professional who, of course, in the initial stages, we're very hopeful and we want to place our trust in somebody who has diplomas and qualifications and should know about this area, so we think. And in those first session or two sessions that we're sharing so much of our history and telling the story again, trying to allow this person understand where we're coming from, our struggles, what we're dealing with today, only to be met with invalidation, a look of confusion, disbelief. Um, perhaps even judgmental and for them to come out with comments such as I think you need to go into therapy with your parents are you sure you are happy not being in contact with your parents because I think that you'll regret that at some stage or um, just that not believing and that this sense that you need to adapt to the family of origin. So with that invalidation, it's is very frustrating, upsetting, and causes us to feel uh, very, very invalidated, which is another injury um, that we experience. So perhaps it's a case that these professionals are very proficient uh, with another type of client, with another form of trauma, um, but they just don't have the knowledge or the expertise for what we need. And my aim with this video is to empower you with how to approach this in a way that will be productive and have you get the best person for the job and not have to experience invalidation or frustration or upset. So one of the key things that we need when we're working with somebody in this very intense way where we will be exposing a lot of the inner workings of our mind, the stuff that has taken place in our childhood, we want to have the no like and trust factor. Uh, so this is very, very important. And when we're looking for somebody to work with, probably the first point to call for you will be the internet and websites and things like that. So what I would suggest is try to narrow down your search to about five different professionals. And hopefully what will help you with that is you know, the information they provide on their website. And then more importantly, if you can find any podcast that they've spoken on or YouTube channel, that will really help you gauge the no like and trust factor for you. Because obviously it's a very individual type of relationship. What would work for one person may not work for you, vice versa. Uh, so it needs to be that personality fit as well as anything else. 
And from my own point of view, when I'm working with one-to-one -one clients, one of the things that makes my process so seamless is that I have so much content online and audios and educational videos that the people who come to me for one-to-one -one work, they know my style, they know how I talk about the subject, they can gauge whether I'm the right person to work with or not um, before they even step into doing a very first phone call with me. So it's amazing how much information, you know, you can gather about, you know, do I like this person? Do I trust them? Is this somebody I want to work with? When we can hear them talking about their topic of expertise, um, you know, just in audio to hear their, how their style, their knowledge, how they approach things. Um, so you might not always have that um, with a lot of professionals. They may not have any audios or videos that you can look at, but you still might get enough information from their website that you think, oh, this person um, looks like a potential. So another thing we can do is view it as you're interviewing them. So, cause they are going to play a very, very important part of your life. And it's definitely worth uh, putting in the effort and the time. I've done this process myself that I'm sharing with you today. And um, it just really helps um, dissect um, the people you who would be suitable from the people who would not be suitable. You also want to have a lot of clarity about what help you are seeking. So even write down maybe five bullet points of what are your main pain points at present that would be really, really helpful if you could get some relief with those. So I would definitely write those down. And it could be things like limiting beliefs that you know you have that are impacting your life. It could be a difficult sibling that you're really trying to navigate that relationship. Uh, it could be things around boundaries with family members <clears throat> and understanding uh, how do I navigate boundaries with family members? Or it could be something like, you know, I've made steps to go no contact and I really need some support from a professional with this. And along with that, what else is important to you in the person that you work with? So the more clarity you have about what type of person you need, the easier your search will be because there are a lot of people out there who are qualified, a lot of really potential, potentially great people to work with. And we just want to narrow that down and make the very, very best decision. So when you've got about five people that look like very good prospects, then I would start to make contact with them, reach out to them. Most of them generally will do um, a complimentary phone call, um, or if it's not stated on their website, I would definitely send them an email and say, you have a few questions to ask them before diving into paid sessions or a paid program. Um, and I'm sure most, if not all, will be very happy to accommodate that. Uh, that's also something that I have done. And what we're doing is we want to vet them and make sure they're the right person for us and make sure they understand about the topic that we need help with. Because if they don't, it can not only be unhelpful for us, but it can set back our healing a long way, which we don't want. It's very painful when that happens. You've probably experienced that already. So after you make contact with them and have got um, an initial phone conversation set up with them, then you want to say, okay, what questions are important for me to ask this person so I can get a clearer picture if they're the right person to help me with what I need help with. And the types of questions that you might ask them, just to give you an idea, are 
what is your understanding of the family scapegoat? See how they answer that question. Have you worked with other people who had the role of the family scapegoat? See how they answer that question. And if you're not too sure, you might want to throw in a more edgier question, such as, do you believe the family scapegoat is part of the problem? That might be a good one to gauge uh, their knowledge of the family scapegoat and if they're going to be a helpful person for you to continue to work with or not. And then you want to understand how are they going to help you. Um, when we work with uh, professionals or therapists, there can be a lot of talking. Uh, I have experienced this myself, uh, that when I went to seek out help, it was me explaining and talking about what had happened. And then at the end of the session, the person said, oh, I'm sure it was helpful to tell your story. And afterwards I'm thinking, no, it wasn't helpful. I know my story. I didn't learn anything new by sharing it. I need help with the impact of the complex childhood trauma. So I'm coming away from that, none the wiser and no relief. So um, that's definitely one thing that is very important for me when I'm working with my one-to-one -one clients that from the get-go, I want them to experience relief and confidence that I can help them. And just to share a little bit about my process when people come to work with me, number one is that they fill in a short questionnaire, not too detailed, just kind of top line stuff about where they are, what's their main struggle, and what do they want to get from working with me. And then if then we go to a one hour, I do a one hour discovery call with that person, which is completely complimentary. That's before they enter into either my three month program or my six month program. So in that um, complimentary call, my aim for that call with this potential client and what we do in that call is I chat with them, get to know them a little bit more. Um, get to know a bit about their situation, their circumstances, their main struggle, because my aim is to offer relief as quickly as I can with the acute pain that is present and that is up at the surface. So even within that hour session, one of the key things I do is we spend approximately 30 minutes and say, for example, if one of the pain points of that person is you know, they say, I've got a limiting belief that I feel like I'm worthless. I know I can feel I have that limiting belief and it's impacting my life and it's creating chaos in my life. Well, then that's something really tangible that we can dive into straight away and we'll start working on that in the discovery call. So at the end of the 30 minutes, they can see how we work with the psychology and understand that process can be very powerful and offer them relief there and then. Um, and they're going away from that session also having every question answered so that they feel 100% confident before embarking on a very intensive three month or six month program with me. So that's how I like to work it, uh, just to give you some ideas for what to expect with this type of trauma recovery work and what you might be looking for potentially in somebody else who can help you with this. One of the other important questions that I really liked to ask a potential therapist is how much do you need to know about my backstory and all of that, you know, because I've had experiences in the past where it was the first session and it was the ses second session, it was the third session, I was still talking, I was very laborious uh, about my childhood, about the family members, about the pain I experienced, about the impact on me. And uh, it wasn't very helpful, to, helpful at all for me. So that was one of the things I was very keen to know, like, can you, you know, 
can I present one thing that I'm struggling with and we work on that? Or do you need to spend three hours in three sessions hearing everything and taking notes about my childhood, my adolescent and all of that? Um, so that was helpful for me to ask that question and to hear their response and to get an idea of what their approach was with that. Um, for me, when I'm working with my one to one clients, I don't it's not something that aligns with me. I don't find it particularly helpful to have my client talking and talking and going over about things that happened in the past. I prefer to have that we woven in to our sessions as we go forward and it's just on a piece by piece basis. And it's more so when we're working with the inner child that those pieces of information then become very, very valuable. But to speak about it in a kind of adult to adult way, just using the cognitive rational brain, I find is not helpful at all because that's not where the trauma lives. The trauma does not live in the cognitive rational brain. It lives in the older, other part of the brain, the amygdala. So when you've had your phone calls with the five potential people that you're looking to work with, then what I would do would be to shortlist it down to your favorite two or three and then proceed with them and take a few sessions with them. Take it easy. Don't commit to anything huge. If you're a little bit unsure, see how it goes. Don't put all your eggs in one basket like no one person is going to be a guru. No one person can kind of sweep in and eradicate all the decades of trauma that you've experienced. They can't really do that in two sessions or something like that. So just um, be mindful and keep in the driving seat of your life like you're the person who knows you best. If something doesn't feel right, definitely bring it up. In the session, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If something didn't sit right with you, definitely bring it up in the next session and make sure that you feel comfortable. And to share with you that one of the modalities, the therapeutic modalities that I have found to be particularly helpful is IFS, which is Internal Family Systems that was created by Richard Schwartz. Um, so perhaps if you're not quite sure where to start, I think that would be a good place to start. If you look at the IFS website, they have a list of uh, people from all around the world who are qualified in that particular modality. The reason I love that modality so much is that it is a very compassionate approach and it's very non-judgmental and it's a gentle way and it works well in the hands of the right person to access the complex childhood trauma and to have an effective way to heal the wounds of the childhood trauma. So I hope that's given you a few tips and recommendations for how to move forward and what to be mindful of. Um, not everybody is trained in scapegoat child abuse, so not every professional will know about it or know how to handle it, even in this day and age. So just be very, very mindful of that. I would say proceed with caution. I'm sure you've got burnt in the past and you want to avoid getting burnt in the future. And with a little bit of care, and foresight and intention and a little bit of a strategy, I'm sure that you can seek out a person who will be amazing and supportive and understanding for your healing journey. And I hope that you find that person. Thanks for watching.